Good morning, everyone. Welcome to VICA's 32nd Annual Business Forecast Conference and to the Workforce Needed Panel. My name is Jim Gormley. I am the Director of Academic Affairs, University of Phoenix, Southern California campus, and I'm privileged to be your moderator today. The University of Phoenix is proud to be the track sponsor for this panel and yesterday's panel, Working from Home versus Back to Work. We also take this opportunity to acknowledge our panel sponsors, the University of California at Los Angeles and the University of West Los Angeles. Since the bi biographies for most of the panelists are already in the journal and online, I am going to make very brief introductions so we may have more time for your questions. So our panelists are Rob Barrett, Professor, University of West Los Angeles, Eric Bullard, Dean, University of California at Los Angeles Extension. Tony Mueller, President, Spectral Lab, a subsidiary of the Boeing Company. Holly Schroeder, President and Chief Executive Officer, Santa Clarita Valley Economic Development Corporation and Chair of the Los Angeles County Workforce Development Board. Times are changing and so are the skills needed to obtain a job. Throughout this journey, we have seen many lose their jobs, but we have also seen the dire need for more workers in essential sectors, such as healthcare, construction, and manufacturing. So what kind of trend can we expect for California and for our nation's workforce as the need for skilled workers begins to shift? As a brief agenda, I'm going to give each panelist a couple of minutes to make an opening statement to get things started. Next, I will ask a question of each panelist. After these first questions and the panelists' responses are done, I will open our discussion for questions from the audience. So Tony, could you open with your uh, two minute introduction, please? Thank you, Jim, and I appreciate the opportunity to be here today along with um, our, our fellow panelists. Um, again, Tony Mueller, president of Spectralab. We are a subsidiary of the Boeing Company located in Silmar, California. We've been in the San Fernando Valley for 65 years, and uh, really since the dawn of the space age, our products have been involved in some national firsts, including the first solar cells on the moon on the Apollo 11 mission with Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong as one example, but also our solar cells power things like the International Space Station and the Mars rovers. Um, so really proud to be here today representing the company. Um, we'll share a little bit more as we go on, but um, just wanted to say thank you. And uh, we've been a big fabric of the San Fernando Valley from a technical and components standpoint for the aerospace industry for a long time and certainly have a lot of perspectives over the last 60 plus years and gone through a lot of changes as well. So look forward to more dialogue uh, throughout the morning here. Thank you so much, Tony. Uh, Dr. Eric, let's hear from you, sir. Uh, yes, good morning. Pleasure to be here and to meet everyone. Um, I am the Dean of UCLA Extension. And for those of you that are not familiar, that's a part of UCLA that serves just over 36,000 non-traditional students. So really working professionals and people that are looking for workforce retraining or upskilling. Um, as I prepared this morning for this conversation, I sort of was reflecting on where we currently are. And I think the thing that strikes me most is that we still really don't know a lot about how the pandemic is ultimately going to affect the economy. So we're still in the middle of you know, determining what the outcome will look like. Um, but what we have seen is that the, the current pandemic has negatively affected really disproportionately middle and working class families. And so I think that as we move forward, I think we have to think about that and how do we provide training opportunities or retraining opportunities for people that were either laid off from their position um, and or had a reduction in their hours, you know, other things I think paying attention to as we move forward beyond some of the sectors that were mentioned in the beginning is that if you think about, you know, our current reality where, you know, businesses are actively limiting human contact, 
that really changes the nature of how I think the future workforce will look. And you're seeing an increasing uh, demand for innovation around robotics, automation, artificial intelligence. Um, so I think a lot of these types of jobs in the future will really require us to think about, you know, what will the future of every sector look like, number one, as we all have to face the reality of working remotely. In the case of UCLA and UCLA Extension, we're offering, you know, 1,500 classes an academic quarter remotely now, whereas predominantly those were all offered on site before. And I oversee 300 staff also working from all corners of Los Angeles. And so the skills that are needed to not only lead and manage organizations, but how do you then keep people tied into a mission, a vision, um, and working together? So I think I'm really interested to hear the rest of the panelists. So I'm happy to be here this morning. Thank you so much, Eric. Well done. Professor Rob, can we have your opening statement? You're on mute, Rob. Chronic problem for me, sorry. Uh, Jim, thank you, and thank you for the reminder. I'm here on behalf of the University of West Los Angeles, and uh, we have campuses in the Valley and uh, near the LAX airport. And I also teach at the University of Laverne out in the East Valley. Uh, I teach law at both law schools, and I also teach undergrads in a business school at the University of Laverne, the basic business law class. And uh, so I guess that I'm on the panel, kind of boots on the ground sort of person, uh, a teacher who teaches uh, people entering the workforce or at the adult education level people re-entering the workforce or enhancing their credentials. And uh, it's kind of lucky for education uh, in, a, in a kind of a terrible backwards way, uh, online education and remote education, both purely online classes and classes that are like the Zoom meeting uh, have been around for decades now. And before uh, it was kind of the stepchild of the education system. And now suddenly uh, online education by and large uh, for young adults and adults is the education system. So uh, our training uh, of people, at least in the short run, um, has been going on for a long time and now it's just increased. So uh, perhaps I can answer questions about uh, what actually goes on in the schools these days in terms of educating students. It's a, a cliche in education nowadays that the majors that our students are in and the jobs they're training for uh, aren't gonna be around by the time they graduate. And so it's the challenge of education to try to stay ahead of the curve, keep up with the curve, and now who knows where the curve is going. So that's where, that's where we are. Thank you so much, Rob. Great insight. And Holly, can we have your opening statement, please? Great. Thank you, Jim. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here with our uh, my fellow esteemed panelists here. Uh, I come at this conversation, as, as Jim indicated in the intro, from two perspectives. One is my role at the Santa Cruz Valley Economic Development Corporation, where we have been working with businesses since the beginning of the uh, pandemic uh, to figure out how they're going to adapt, what's essential, how do they, how do they make these changes uh, to their operations, uh, helping them understand the public health orders and how that's going to affect them, their operations and their employees. Uh, I'm also chair of the uh, LA County Workforce Development Board, which covers 50 plus cities in LA County, including Santa Clarita. And so as I work with them, uh, we've really been figuring out how does the workforce system that trains uh, em employees who are looking for work, uh, how does that system adapt to our new reality? And as I, as I reflect on 2020 so far, it's still not over, uh, I know, you know, we went from sort of one major workforce crisis to another significant workforce crisis. Uh, you know, the beginning of the year and in 2019, we really were in a situation where workers were really hard to find. We were at record low unemployment. And so uh, the biggest issue we heard from, from companies was we need to find workers and then we need to help them get skilled as rapidly as possible so that they can do work. Uh, and now, uh, what we see is this tremendous displacement 
And, but since it has been very uh, you know, sector driven uh, by those that are more public facing versus those that are like Tony's business that has remained essential and remained open, you really see this fragmenting of, what, of, of where workers can go. You have companies that are booming and are really looking for workers and companies that are, have really been struggling as a result. And how do you get folks to pivot and change into these new work, these new jobs that are available? How do they transfer those skills? And you know, that's really the challenge in front of the workforce board and certainly all of my fellow panelists that are in the education system is to try to help those, those employees find that where their skills can transfer to new work. Wonderful, thank you so much, Holly. Now I have just a, a brief announcement to make and that has to do with asking questions. So the best way to ask a question of our speakers is for members of the audience to click on the link below for Zoom, and then you can type in a question that speakers will see and can answer. Or if you wanna stay on Pathable, please send your question through the chat box on Pathable and VICA staff will make sure that the question gets over to me. So we're gonna start with our panelist questions and um, Tony, we're gonna to start with you first, sir. We have seen a lot of industries and sectors that have been imp impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. How has COVID-19 impacted your operations? Uh, thank you, Jim, for the question. It's certainly been an interesting, demanding and challenging uh, last seven to eight months. There's no doubt about it. In our particular business at Spectre Lab, um, being an aerospace component supplier, it's been uh, very uh, important, first of all, to keep our workforce safe. Um, about 85% of our workforce remains on site. We've actually grown through the last six or seven months. So that was some of that was pre-planned and some of that quite honestly was an uptick in our business. Uh, so to that end, we've really had to um, rethink operations, uh, physically distancing of personnel in a manufacturing environment. Um, we've had to rethink and retool in terms of how we communicate for those employees who are offsite uh, via mediums such as this one, Zoom or WebEx or other channels and how we interact with each other safely while still getting our, our mission statement done for our customers. Um, and uh, some of them are very critical um, for our nation and for the world to get our products out. Um, so I think in, in, in summary, um, we've had to really uh, turn a new page and redefine how we work and how we communicate. And as we get into it, I think we've learned a lot about ourselves, learned best practices, uh, learned how to be innovative and rely on technology. I think it was referenced, you know, we have to um, think about spacing of operations. We've had to think about um, shift strategies um, so that we can uh, maybe de-densify some of the work environment. Um, there are indeed challenges in some sectors of the economy. We all know that. In our particular sector right now, we're seeing a growing demand for satellite products. And you can maybe think through that um, our, our Boeing satellite business, for instance, is doing quite well, and um, there's a need to communicate that that's going to be enduring. And uh, this summer and in in, uh, in the last three months, especially, we've seen an uptick in companies buying satellites, and that immediately flows into suppliers like us that uh, provide components for those satellites. So the capital flow has been there, um, the business case has been there. And it's, it's been worldwide as well as uh, domestically. And I think as maybe a, a, if I have a chance, I'll talk a little bit more about this later. Um, for the workforce, I think the word we use is agility. Um, we have to constantly be able to think about where could we pivot? Where is the next demand coming from? And from a workforce standpoint, how do we need to train our employees differently and as far as new employees coming on the job, what are some of the skill sets that are really gonna be needed in the future, whether you're in a virtual environment or in a, 
uh, on-site environment. Excellent, Tony, thank you so much. Just a uh, follow-on question for you. Uh, from your position and your perspective and experience, are there any industries that seem to be growing despite the economic and public health crisis? Well, I think um, a number of my colleagues on the panel referenced this. There's uh, certainly um, essential businesses and in, 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 our, in our particular sector, um, we are growing and uh, we're essential business in, in many definitions um, in the transportation and defense sectors. Um, and we see that need in certain sectors of the economy where there's actually a demand. There is, uh, in some cases, a shortage of workers right now. And we need to understand, can we take uh, workers that have been displaced from other sectors of the economy and quickly pivot? I think the answer is yes. Um, I, I think it uh, kind of starts with um, in an own personal sense at the individual level, uh, can, I, can I adjust? Can I think about a new future, um, which could be exciting actually. I know it's very challenging right now, um, the times that we're in, but uh, can we get our heads wrapped around a, a different career path potentially? And could I even get um, more in terms of uh, where I wanna go in my career? Um, through just a little bit of fine tuning of skills. Um, we've seen a huge demand for um, just being able to flex through computer skills and um, being able to put together um, online material, whether it be training or uh, presenting online. And those skills I think can be readily learned through some of the vehicles that some of my colleagues have even, whether it's, you know, some a course that you take at a UCLA extension or uh, somewhere else. So um, our, our, our other message I think is, and this, um, this is not statistically um, proven yet, but um, I think there are anecdotal points right now where there may be for a while a need, and this goes across the globe, a need to have more of a domestic sourcing uh, potential. Uh, regardless of industry, actually, because of just some of the challenges right now on international travel and even trade at times where you have to produce either products or services locally. And to that end, the industries or sectors that may not have been as vibrant as they were in the past are um, seemingly beginning to get a little bit more interest in terms of the local dynamics. So those are just a few thoughts, Jim. Thank you for, uh, for the question. Wow, thank you so much, Tony. So Eric, what can we do to help people get into the workforce more quickly, especially in the industries that continue to thrive during the COVID-19 pandemic? Yes, uh, I think picking up on what Tony was just mentioning, I think it's important for us to think about the fact that colleges and universities will need to be really nimble also in their approaches and serving you know, audiences that are looking to retrain and go into new careers. So we're really talking about programs that extend beyond traditional degree programs uh, and, and perhaps even certificates that those might be too long. So I, I would think that moving forward, we've got to really focus on micro-credentialing, uh, making sure that we understand the skills necessary for these sectors. Um, so looking at some sort of a, a skills gap analysis when you're working with participants to then determine what skills would they need to really obtain in order to move into an, a completely new profession. Um, beyond that, I think that one of the things that Holly referenced in her role is really critically important to this whole, this whole puzzle is that connecting everyone. And so I think colleges, universities, both public, private, um, need to really do a better job of connecting with businesses, with governmental agencies, and making sure that we're connecting people to the resources that are already in existence. So Holly referenced the, the LA County Workforce Investment Board. I think that's a great opportunity to really bring people together and have conversations about where there is a need for you know, workers if there's a shortage, because certainly we know that the unemployment rate has been increasing. So I think we have to do a better job of also making sure that people know that jobs are, are out there, that they exist, and that you know, oftentimes they can tap into federal training dollars 
um, either through WIBS, or Workforce Investment Boards, or through the state of California's Employment Development Department and making sure that they understand that they don't have to pay out of pocket for these programs and retraining. Um, I think that also, you know, looking at um, the strengthening again of ties, I think is the one piece that I would say is a major takeaway here is that I think that in this instance, we can't really operate in a vacuum. Universities and colleges can't really sit on their own and say, here's what we think the future will be. So we're gonna develop programs based on what we think. This is where we have to engage in that critical dialogue and really delving into understanding, you know, if it's manufacturing, what are the critical skills needed? What are the businesses seen as deficiencies in the workforce and, and why is there a gap? And so um, I think these are all things that we have to focus on moving forward. And I would hope in LA, there's an opportunity for us to come together. I think colleges, universities, um, business industry, workforce investment boards, I would hope that as we move forward, thinking back even to 2008, 2009 with the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, there were a lot of federal funds coming you know, out at that time. And I know that a lot of colleges and universities and businesses tapped into that. And so I think that I, I would imagine that's on the horizon for us. So I think this is the time for us to really sort of come together and have those critical dialogues. And again, even launching public campaigns for, for workers to understand, you know, there, here are the training programs, here are where the jobs are, here's how we can connect you to, you know, gainful employment. Great, thank you so much, Eric. So Rob, Tony and Eric have provided some great insight when it comes to opportunities of our workforce. As a law and business professor, how are you preparing students to enter the workforce given the current circumstances as a result of COVID-19? Uh, great question, Jim. What I'm hearing from, and I may come away from this panel learning more than I contribute, what I'm hearing from people at the, at the higher level, the umbrella level, at the deaconal level like uh, Eric, and uh, also from Tony and Holly that are responsible for these very broad programs. Down here at the professor level where I'm interacting with students and not, and not making those kinds of decisions, I hear that a lot from the deans of my law schools uh, about the big picture kinds of questions that they're talking about. From my end, a lot of it is just kind of developed organically because uh, students are now, in, in most cases, especially in California and in LA where I am, uh, and the Valley, uh, our campuses are not opening. Students, uh, for better and mostly for worse, at the undergraduate level, uh, are not having the benefit of the college experience. And I wonder what effect uh, that's going to have on them uh, my job puts me in touch with many, many young people. And I also have a, a relatively young family member and they're so socially isolated now. The way they interact with each other is very different than the way that, that all of us here uh, interact. Instagram and Facebook and Pinterest and TikTok and all of these platforms, uh, tell you the truth, I'm not on them. And I don't speak that language. There was an excellent article in the New York Times about uh, the popularity of a fellow named PewDiePie, who I'd never heard of and who has millions of followers. And the point of the article was that people in my generation, and I'm in my 70s, uh, younger people, it's the equivalent, they see ultraviolet light that I don't see. And they speak a language that I don't speak and they have a shared experience that old people like me do not have. And I think that's an issue for the coming workforce for young people going through the undergraduate program. Uh, their experience with social media and social media marketing, uh, because part of what I do in the undergraduate program is deal with uh, the marketing program. I teach business law to undergraduates. So, so we have a, a youthful emerging workforce that's very different uh, from me. And it's very hard for me to stay up with the curve and I do my best, uh, but it's going to be different for people that are hiring in the marketplace now. You're going to get workers that don't have the kind of shared experiences that older people do. 
The adult workforce, on the other hand, uh, it's all about retraining and recredentialing. And those people are probably going to be more accessible to folks like you who are taking care of, of hiring. Uh, on the day-to-day -day level, I know this is kind of stream of consciousness, but I'm not sure how else to, to do it. Uh, I moonlight as a lawyer. And I was involved in my first virtual trial a couple of weeks ago, which was a lot like this. Uh, one of the windows, uh, the court was in session and the judge wore a mask and she had multiple screens. There was a bailiff and a translator and there were some witnesses in the courtroom, socially distanced, some lawyers and other people appearing virtually. Uh, and that is very much a brave new world. And for the foreseeable future, uh, much of legal practice is going to be like that. And that's probably foreign to most business people. It's far to most lawyers. The only saving grace I would say from my end as a, as a teacher is, as I, I said a little bit in my introduction, uh, as kind of an afterthought and mostly as a convenience for certain groups of people, there has always been remote learning and, and online education, what they call synchronous and asynchronous. Asynchronous is where you just do the class on the computer. There are no live lectures. Everything's pre-recorded. Uh, the materials are on the internet and you just work your way through it. It's kind of a self-study thing. And we have now because of Zoom and WebEx and the other platforms, we have live classes that are a lot like uh, the meeting that we're here now. Uh, I see uh, the five of us uh, in uh, my class last night at one of my law schools, there were 75 people in the room. And it's one thing to do that in a big amphitheater style lecture hall, and it's another thing to do it online. So uh, talk about nimble. I am running at top speed just to keep up with what's changing at my end of education. So, uh, Eric, I wish you a lot of luck. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rob. Well done. Holly, many employers have had to transition to working from home and have continued their operations remotely. Can you talk about some of the challenges employers have been faced with? Yeah, we've spent a lot of time since the beginning really talking to our companies about how they're adapting. And we had, you know, the first you know, few weeks was, you know, just chaos for these companies. It's not just, uh, you know, how do they start working from home, but how do they make sure all their employees have the equipment? You know, everybody knows about the toilet paper shortage. Well, there was a computer shortage and a modem shortage and a uh, display shortage. And so people who did it, we had companies that were, you know, in, in the technology space that do digital marketing or they, uh, they produce uh, gaming, gaming companies and some of those types of companies, they had no problem because everybody was working on laptops and they just took them home. But for a lot of other companies, you know, maybe in, in the financial space or the insurance space or in a, in an area like, you know, in manufacturing like Tony's where they, uh, they suddenly had to figure out how to do that. And they had all of the challenges that Rob just talked about, about trying to learn some of these new technologies. Some of these, they, uh, they suddenly are using uh, collaboration platforms like Zoom, but, but like Slack and you know, Microsoft Teams. And, and these are software programs that a lot of these employees had never had any experience with. So there was a huge sort of learning curve of how do you, um, how do you collaborate and how do you work when you're working from home, it's like, if I have a question of somebody, do I call them? Do I message them? Am I interrupting them? You can't tell because you don't really, you're not hearing whether they're on the phone or those things like when you might otherwise, you know, bop your head into their office or cubicle. And, but I think people have really, have learned how to deal with this. And so the new challenge that uh, companies are facing is you know, what's the right balance of working from home versus employing uh, safe procedures within the workplace. You know, Tony talked about how they've done that within their manufacturing space, the production space, which as an essential business, we have many manufacturers who've, had to, who've done that and they've been employing new sanitation techniques and separation and shift changes and, and all sorts of things like that. 
well, how do you do that? Do you do that? And if so, how with your workers who could work from home, but what, what at what cost? I mean, do you have those employers, uh, those companies, do they lose a little bit of their culture? Do they lose a little bit of their, uh, di their uh, interpersonal dynamics? And if so, what is, you know, what's the cost of that? And you know, on one hand, you have companies that say, we're gonna just stay working remote. Uh, but then there's other companies that say, I think we're losing something uh, by not having the interactivity and what's the right balance there. So we're hearing companies wanting to have some sort of a hybrid and they're trying to figure out that balance of, you know, maybe you work from home, you know, so many days a month, but you come into an office that is uh, depopulated in terms of density and how many people are there. You come in certain days a month and, and you try to find a balance because uh, it is a different type of interaction uh, to have the entirety of your work uh, as opposed to project work, the entirety of your work being online and companies are now really struggling to figure out uh, what those balance, what that balance is for each of them individually. Whoa, well done, Holly. Thank you. We're going to take a few questions from the audience now. Thank you so much, panel. Uh, you've, given, I, you, you've given the audience a whole bunch to think about. Uh, you've certainly given this guy a whole bunch to think about. But um, there's a question here. It, it's, it's a, um, let's see. I'm going to just open this to the panel. And so uh, if it's within your scope, just go ahead and jump in. So here's the question. When you look at employers' needs and workers' comforts, what do you see as a bridge to align these gaps? Jim, I'll, I'll take that one. And um, Thanks, you know, Tony. Yeah, we're, um, we're constantly trying to feel the pulse of the workforce. And uh, one thing that we've re really been focused on is communication. You cannot over communicate during this time frame. I just had an all employee meeting <laughs> Tuesday and um, we did some things there that could have been done pre COVID-19 such as um, instant polling during the, um, during the presentation. So we were able to get really the pulse of the workforce with some, you know, we take a pause and ask a question, what do people think about X? and react to it and um, you know with our leadership team think about what we want to do with the with the answers that we're getting um, but I've really stressed communication because uh, you can you can quickly get into um, a bubble or a silo in which an employee who's virtual may not feel connected um, is constantly just on their computer maybe at home meanwhile you have a person in the manufacturing uh, side of things who's, you know, wearing a face covering, having to work a little bit different and may need help from a person who's on site or off site and how to get that help is not as easy as just uh, walking 50 feet away because maybe that other person isn't there. So what we've really tried to do is to emphasize communication. Um, I, I often talk to myself and my teams about, you know, phone calls over emails, if we cannot meet in person and we're trying to limit the amount of in-person meetings as you know, business essential, but you can still make a phone call. And um, you know, we have so many different communication vehicles now, a text, instant messaging, Zoom, WebEx, but what about just talking to somebody? And I, I think back to your question about the bridge it's to reach out, and this is an individual responsibility, and you know we try to foster this at the company level too, but um, really create those bridges and take a time out and just reach out to someone because there is a lot of uncertainty out there in terms of, okay, how is this gonna be different? And when, when are things gonna change back to normal and, and things like that? And so we've had to adjust to a new normal and we've really, tried to emphasize frequent employee communication as a bridge. Perfect, thank you so much, sir. You know, I Let's could see. jump in a little bit on that, Jim, is uh, yes, I mean, definitely I would, I would agree with everything Tony said. One of the things we hear from our companies is, you know, if you didn't have a good trust relationship with your employees, 
uh, you're you're in trouble. <laughs> you know, uh, it's really going to show up in this because there is so much communication that's needed and it's taking these different forms. Um, but as I indicated in, in the previous question, I we're starting to see companies like just rethink their real estate plan. Um, you know, do we want people coming? All, like, let's just you know hypothetically say there's an office in downtown Los Angeles. Well, maybe we don't want everybody coming to downtown Los Angeles every day. Maybe they have a satellite in Long Beach or a satellite in Santa Cruz or a satellite in Laverne. And uh, they have a smaller footprint there than employees where they have you know, employees that they go. So there is some communication and collaboration amongst their employees on whatever frequency, again, they have to decide what works for them. But you know, I think employers are finding employees don't want to commute as much. They've realized they don't have to commute as much. And so the conventional commute uh, is, you know, is not what employer, employees are looking for. And that's probably actually a really good thing for Los Angeles. I'd spread that out a little bit, but they're making them realize that they have much more flexibility than they used to. But they, as Tony said, you have to be absolutely transparent with the, uh, in the communication between employer employee so that these companies can really figure out what's the right balance, what's the right mix. Uh, doesn't look like it's preferential to one group of employees over another group of employees. Uh, what about those that do have to come into a physical space for production? Uh, you know, how do you balance that? Uh, is it seen as a perk? You know, these kinds of things are really uh, questions that employers have to grapple with and have very uh, open conversations with their employees about how they're gonna operate. Great input, thank you so much. Anyone else have a comment with regard to the uh, question, the audience question? Well, I have a kind of a short one um, from the, that I've been hearing, it's a different demographic, it's students and particularly undergraduate students. Uh, and I've been hearing this in a lot of different places. There's such a thing as too much communication and uh, you've got text and you've got email and you've got chat and you've got Zoom and there's Zoom fatigue. And a lot of students, I got, uh, I was on an email thread amongst a bunch of professionals and someone wrote what they, I am sure thought was very important because it went on and on and on for pages. And somebody replied to the group, something that I had to Google, which was TLDR. Anyone seen that? E L D R, too long, didn't read, send. <laughs> and I have seen that in more than one place. Uh, you won't wow. get it from the students. The students just won't, they just get overwhelmed and they stop signing into their emails. Uh, but I had to look that up, T L D R, too long, didn't read. So I would say the, the other side of the coin is too many Zoom meetings, too many emails, too many texts and so forth. Uh, can be overwhelming. Excellent. I wrote that one down. I'd never heard that before. Be careful who you send it to. Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Very good. Can I just Let's add, see. I think picking up on that just quickly, I, I think Rob is onto something there from what I've experienced. Um, and I'll pick on my own institution is that there's this tendency to want to replicate what we had face to face in Zoom. And so while that makes sense in certain, I think, you know, ways, I think actually we really need to rethink how we communicate in general, because sitting in a two hour meeting like we used to do back in a conference room, which I didn't really love then either when it was face to face, but now doing that in a Zoom room, I think is even more problematic because honestly, most people probably are not really paying attention. They're probably multitasking. So I think really chunking up communication in a way that you can, it's more palatable. I think that's what Rob is onto and those students are really referencing is that, you know, communicate more frequently, but you don't need to communicate excessively in the sense that you can communicate in a one or two minute video chat, for example, and not have to have a 30 or 45 minute meeting. And so that's what I'm really personally trying to work with in my own organization is to change the expectation is that reducing the, the meeting times um, which at first people really, they were offended by that. And they said, well, now you're not giving me enough face time. And I said, well, we're trying to 
we're trying to rethink how we're going to message things out here. But anyway, I think this is an important piece of the future of work that I think we need to spend more time thinking about. Excellent. Yes, sir. Uh, just a, a question for me to you on that subject. Uh, do you believe that in the future we will have more short face-to-face -face Zoom type meetings rather than having so much written narrative? Uh, so I think so, and I and I think some of these tools that you're seeing, for example, if you're, if you're familiar with Slack or some of these instant messaging tools, I actually am finding that very helpful myself because if somebody sends me an email, um, my email inbox just stacks up, and right. you know I may not get to it, but if they have a quick question in in my day, I can even if I'm in a Zoom meeting, look over and say, okay, they have a simple question that they've asked, I can answer this and continue to move the business along. So I think that. Certainly these tools will help us in the future. And then something that I think Tony referenced also is something to pay attention to. We may not be recruiting a workforce from the region any longer. We may, you know, this pandemic is really probably going to change where people live and, and how they work. So we're gonna have to then be open to having both on ground and remote workforces that come together. Um, and that's something else that I think has to be paid attention to. I don't have an answer on that myself just yet, but it's certainly something that I'm thinking a lot about. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. So we have a next question. What evolution and innovation is necessary to achieve business growth and successes as we continue down this new normal path? Can I, I'll, sorry to talk so much here, but I just wanna pick up on something that Rob also said earlier that I think we don't wanna lose sight of because we talked about sort of the existing workforce, people that have experience that might need to be retrained. But one thing I think that businesses will really need to think about, and again, to focus on my own sector and, and colleges, universities, higher ed, is how do, we, how do we get students the experiences that they need in this new normal? And so I think looking at alternatives such as apprenticeships, um, and really trying to connect them to businesses so that they can have that experience that's necessary to land a job. Because I think they're going to be really put at a disadvantage moving forward. So I can't imagine coming out of, of an undergraduate program now, you know, and trying to find a job in this new reality, because it's, it's just not the same. You're having to interview uh, through Zoom. <laughs> so you're not actually meeting people face to face. You're not getting the opportunity to experience a physical workforce. Um, and, and I think that's something, again, that is going to really change the way the future of the workforce looks and the way that businesses are going to have to interact with you know, educational providers to make sure that there's a pipeline of individuals to fill their workforce. Um, but apprenticeships, internships, and these alternatives, I think, are going to be really important. Excellent. You know, I think it's going to be really important that, you know, I can go radical on this, you know, I mean, I think we'll see how radical things end up, but um, I think it's really important that we teach people and the people recognize the skills that they bring and not be just focused on this is my job. I think you really are at a point where, as we learned in March, like everything can change on a dime. Um, and, you know, God forbid that happened again, but, you know, everything can change so rapidly for a company, for, for an employee, uh, for what's going to happen when, you know, when the, the health order came down in March. And uh, in order, if we take one lesson from that, I think it needs to be that we have to be prepared to adjust rapidly depending on what's happening. And if we really embrace that, that could be a very good thing for many of our businesses. Uh, but if we stay rigid and say, no, my job is X and Y, and if I do X and Y, then, you know, if I'm not, I'm out of my, you know, I'm out of my pay grade, and we have all some of these rigid structures that we've created, you know, that might be, uh, that might really be limiting us. And, uh, you know, Rob and I have spoke uh, when we, we, in our prep about, you know, maybe some of our employment laws are, are not flexible enough for dealing uh, with, uh, with the situation that we are, you know, when we're all working from home, like I am right now. And how do you how do you adapt that? And more if we focus on skills. And I think if we have a company that I interviewed on our podcast that talked about that this is a manufacturing company, and they talked about that they loved hiring people from fast food. This is all pre-COVID, but the, the lesson I think remains, and it was because the, if you're working fast food, 
you, you're taking an order, you're filling an order, you're exchanging cash, you're talking to somebody through uh, you know, a microphone off to the drive through or whatever, you're doing multiple things at once. And this company is one that is a small operation and really loved that ability to multitask. So they saw the skill of being able to think about multiple things at once. And, and so the employees that saw that that's what they had could move there and, and quickly advance. If they thought, oh no, I'm in restaurant, retail, fast food, and that was my only career path, then they would see that as limiting versus as a major uh, pathway into you know, a whole another field that they might not have contemplated. I think that ability to focus on what are the skills you're bringing to the table and employers to learn what are the skills that they need and think of coming from unconventional places will, will help us build more flexibility into how we think about our work. And that really could be really great for uh, our economic recovery. Excellent. Thank you so much, Holly. Well done. So we have uh, another question. Uh, this is a good one. Mental health and wellness for continued production and workforce engagement can be a concern with the remote or quarantine schedules working from home. How do the different employers adjust to that? And actually all four of you might have something to say about that. So um, anyone that wants to start, just jump right in. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll start, Jim. Okay, um, go ahead. And I'll kind of build build on something that um, uh, Holly was mentioning a little while ago. Um, but first, kind of hit this one head on. I think it goes back to something I was saying earlier about keeping in touch with people. People, we don't want people disconnected. And that that's hard. It takes a time out. It takes being deliberate and intentional about checking in on people, um, showing that you care. And um, I'm sure we've all got our own experiences in that, but um, I, I go back to just talking to people on the phone. People wanna have a conversation. Um, as we talked about a few minutes ago, there's information overload at times, but uh, it goes back to taking a time out, connecting with people, uh, making sure people feel valued um, and I, I think, you know, mental health is certainly a big thing that we all need to be um, cognizant of um, during these times. Went back to something that I wanted to mention on what Holly was saying, and we, your question earlier that we got, uh, Jim. Um, I really think, and I'm talking from a, a standpoint of somebody who's running a business, that brand trust is so important right now. And the question kind of, well, how are we gonna be innovative and maybe grow the business in the future? Um, to me, it's first getting back to basics. Brand trust, and we see this in our consumer lives, our personal lives. Who can we rely on? What, what product can we rely on? What business can we rely on? What educational institution set can we rely on? during these uncertain times. People want some amount of certainty and this plays back into the mental health thing. They want some amount of normal in their personal lives and their work lives as much as they can. And they know it's not perfect, but they want normal as much as possible. And so what we've really tried to do, get back to basics. You know, we've got a brand that's been around 60 plus years, as I mentioned, and really emphasize our focus is always has been but customer intimacy delivering certainty delivering an outcome that is fairly certain to the customer and you could apply that across all sorts of products and services in our economy and then coming back and weaving in hey how can we be more innovative i think my comment there is um, be measured in how much innovation and how soon and make sure it works going back to the brand trust because if you do something really out there and it doesn't work and it could impact your brand trust, that's not gonna do you any good in the long run. So um, just, just some thoughts on maybe back to basics. Perfect. <clears throat> Anyone else wanna jump in? I. 
I'm still thinking about something uh, Holly and Eric said about internships and uh, placement of students in situations where they develop uh, some of the skills that are going to help them evolve and innovate. And in a way, it also ties to, I think, the mental health and wellness uh, concept. And, and as Tony mentioned, uh, some normalcy. I, I can't speak to what they're doing with undergraduates and there are all kinds of laws about uh, students doing internships that they're not getting paid for and that kind of thing. But for internships where there are academic credit, uh, I can talk to that in the, on the law side because I run those sorts of programs, uh, externship placement programs that I have for, for a long time. And what I'm finding is that there has been no downturn at all in the number of businesses that want students uh, to come in and to learn and to help. And it's a bargain for the business and it's a bargain for the students because the students are learning and the businesses are getting free help training and also getting to look at potential employees. A lot of these externships lead to full-time uh, job offers afterwards. And that's a bit of, a bit of normal. Uh, to feel like things are going on uh, uh, to a great extent as they did before. And there's a, a, a huge comfort in that. Um, I read somewhere, you know, I've, you, you do so much. I'm, I'm very much at home quite a bit. I'm old and, I'm, you know, in these groups, I got a summons for jury duty. And when I wrote back, they practically called me and said, stay home, don't come to court, you're too old you're gonna get sick. So I'm very isolated. And uh, so getting students involved in these things and also adult learners uh, in externships at businesses they may wanna go into, uh, both I think uh, uh, promotes that sense of normalcy and stability and the world has not ended. Uh, and so I would encourage businesses to take advantage of these student resources that are, that are out there at every level, undergraduate, law, business, medicine, they're all a lot of students who, uh, who want to get involved that way. Uh, and it's a win-win for both sides. One random thought that I had, you know, the internet and Zoom and all of this activity, what if the pandemic had hit as short as four years ago or back when we were all on DOS and mm. dial-up. And if it had been 10 years ago, I, I mean, everything would have ground to a complete halt. So, so in a way, I, I was starting to say this article I read is that humans are adaptable and it takes some ridiculously short amount of time to adapt to really dramatic adverse circumstances. I, I think the number I read was 21 days, but whatever it was, it was less than a month. It takes me a little longer. Maybe, maybe my parts are wearing down, but I think young people are adapting very quickly. And so um, I know that's kind of a, a mashup of the wellness concept and also innovation and, and externships, but uh, excellent. Thank, thank goodness for the internet. Yeah, yes. Yes, uh, in this day and age, you're absolutely right. Uh, well done. Is there anyone else that, that uh, has a comment uh, relative to uh, what we're taking a look at with this question? Yeah, Jim, I think, you know, we're, we're slightly different as a public institution, but I would say one of the things that we've really tried to do for our workforce is to ensure that we're really flexible where we can be with their work hours. Um, so we've actually provided additional administrative leave for COVID, um, recognizing that, you know, many of our employees they might be caretakers for parents. They might um, have, you know, children. That's something that we've. I know a lot of our workforce has really struggled with is juggling being a parent and having to homeschool, you know, their children, and then also having to be on Zoom meetings and, you know, answering telephones for us and speaking to prospective students. So what we've tried to do is really create structures so that we're, we're much more flexible than we previously were with start times, with end times. Um, and actually we found that that's really helpful because you know everyone else is experiencing the same change in their schedules. So not everyone expects us to be there eight to five necessarily. 
And so I think it's important for businesses and, and all sectors really to think about being more flexible around the work schedule itself. Um, and then more specifically, just within my own organization at UCLA Extension, um, we have a really active group of staff that are focused on institutional climate. And so we have an events committee, for example, that it may sound silly, but they focus on events and, and we've tried to continue and maintain that structure so that if we were in the physical workplace, for example, this week, there would have been a contest around costumes and, you know, sort of fun activities, but it's, you know, maintaining a human connection. And so we've really replicated that through Zoom. And so, you know, I think there are ways that as, you know, businesses and governmental agencies, we still have to remember that we're, we're humans and that we, we require human interaction. So that, that constant outreach, I think, is important and finding ways to connect in sort of non-work ways that what we're missing now, the water cooler talk or a happy hour after work. I mean, those things, I think, used to go a really long way to advance companies. And unfortunately, now we're having to determine how do we replicate that online. But I think that companies really should continue to try to do those things. Very well said. I know you and, uh, well, you, Tony, and Holly, uh, not as much Rob because he's in the classroom, but the three of you have uh, fairly large employee contingents underneath your uh, scope of authority. And I would be interested in, uh, say like Eric, a while ago, you said that you've got some 300 people that, that uh, report somehow to you. And uh, I'd be interested in what you're doing relative to what you just described, uh, uh, having that engagement. Uh, I know we do it at University of Phoenix. We have a Zoom party every Friday, and that certainly helps to keep us uh, tied to one another. But I'd like to hear what you're doing with the number of people you have. Yeah, thanks for that, Jim. And I think I'd add the caveat that I entered this position in January. So I have actually spent more time now working remotely than I was on site in Westwood. So I think that's one challenging aspect. So a lot of my staff really are interested in getting to know me personally. Um, and even though we had some on-ground events in my first few months, um, what we've now started to do is um, I'm holding uh, every Friday, I have these smaller coffee chat sessions where we have three to five staff come in and uh, they can, there's no agenda. They can just get uh, opportunity to have conversations, bring things to me directly. I think that's been helpful. Um, we have uh, regular town hall meetings now to make sure that all the staff understand, you know, the direction that we're headed in to provide them with updates. But I think there's another piece here that to me is critical is that to make sure that it's not just me communicating. And so, and, and I'll be honest, we've struggled with this a little bit across the organization but making sure that you know, associate deans and directors, other managers are also then doing those same things. I think that's really critically important because it can't just be one person communicating. Right, very well said, thank you so much. I have another question for you uh, as the panel. What do you believe the biggest obstacles will be in the workforce arena as we go into the new year? And anyone go ahead and jump in when, uh, when you feel like it? Well, I think, I mean, it's obviously that we still have, you know, 15% unemployment in LA County. Uh, we have, you know, a tremendous uh, amount of workforce that is uh, looking for work, uh, trying to figure out how to adapt. And we have not dealt with unemployment levels this high in, you know, in a decade, uh, maybe longer. And so, and it is concentrated in certain types of jobs uh, that are, you know, more of uh, public consumer oriented businesses uh, that, and so it is, it, it, it's stuff that affects the entire economy rather than uh, even the, the financial crisis was centered in, you know, home building and mortgages and, uh, you know, it affected a lot of people, but this is really has such ripple effects against across so many member, uh, so many elements of the economy, and so many elements of the economy that are heavily relied upon in Los Angeles. Uh, you know, you know, maybe you know disproportionately relied upon because we rely on tourism, uh, we rely on uh, significant events. We would have you know a battle between Eric and Tony about USC versus UCLA. 
uh, and uh, you know those kinds of you know challenges. Uh, you know those are big, uh, big public. Uh, activities that, that drive a lot of our local economy that are really just on hold. And we don't see a foreseeable future about when that's going to return. So in the meantime, we have to be thinking about how do you convert these folks into um, job opportunities in the sectors that are growing uh, and, and, and reorient and retrain and reskill so that those folks can go into the parts, because uh, there are parts of the economy that are growing. I mean, e-commerce in general, I mean, is absolutely, uh, you know, is absolutely on fire and, and parts of the economy that, you know, used to be retail, public facing are now moving into e-commerce. And, uh, you know, we have to, uh, those companies are, are hungry for employees. Uh, we just have to get folks to figure out how to make that shift, feel comfortable with that shift, uh, be interested in that shift. And, uh, and uh, in order to, to sort of try, start to bring that unemployment rate down. Oh, well said. Uh, anyone else have some thoughts on that one? Okay, um, let's see. Here's one. Uh, how is your organization conducting interviews and what creative new practices have you enabled for developmental and professional training opportunities? Yeah, I'll throw that one out again. How is your organization conducting interviews and what creative new practices have you enabled for developmental and professional training opportunities? Well, I'll take, go, go ahead, Rob. If you want to. Oh well, well, this is just a short, and and since I'm not, you know, at the at the top managerial level, uh, like the other panelists, my view is more of the the micro view. Uh, but one of the organizations that I work for uh, is involved in um, generating a program uh, in China. I, I spent a couple of summers as a guest lecturer in China at a couple of their universities. And, and I'm finding myself on a lot of WeChat phone calls, collaborating uh, with folks in China and using Google Translate and a lot of these uh, other tools, which is, is really a challenge because it's tomorrow right now in Beijing. For, you know, it's a different date entirely. Uh, to go back and forth is 13 hours on a plane. If you go to Australia, it's even longer. Uh, so I think there's gonna to have to be a lot more and there will be a lot more because of the dependency on the internet and these, these kind of visual meetings. Um, people are gonna be changing the way they interact, at least from my end down here as a worker. Excellent, well said. Yeah, I would just add in terms of interviewing, I think, and again, back to our earlier conversation, in some ways we've really just replicated what would have taken place on ground using tools like Zoom. And so recently in the last you know, six months, I've onboarded a new CFO and a new CMO. And I think that's, it's been interesting because it occurred to me earlier this week because I, I typically work on site one day a week where some of my senior leaders come together and I realized uh, that person, the CFO, had never met anyone on our team face to face. And so this is, it's interesting when you think about the interview process now, because they're coming together in these Zoom rooms. Um, one aspect though, for at least the senior leadership type role is that we, we've we integrated more of a town hall approach where the candidates actually then have an opportunity to present around particular items. And then the entire staff can ask questions. Um, we also have created feedback mechanisms so that surveys, for example, are submitted after each candidate if it's a public search um, so that everyone really has an opportunity to then participate. Um, you know, looking at professional development training opportunities, I'd say this is what we do. This is what we do as an organization. So I, I think it's really offering our classes either online in an asynchronous format or, or like this where it's more of a uh, flipped type classroom where you're you're not necessarily just lecturing but you're also then dealing with you know real world problems and so we, we're doing a lot of that actually with our teams and trying to support supervisors for example and how do you manage and lead remote teams how do you keep up you know morale at, at this very difficult time 
Uh, so we're doing a lot of that type of work as an organization. Excellent. Thank you, sir. It's really, it's really important for companies to do what I think Eric said earlier, which is rethink how they are doing this. Uh, it's, you know, because there's one thing for, I think for your, your higher level folks, like Eric's describing, you know, who work largely independently and, um, you know, and are leading teams that obviously we all have to figure out how to lead teams in this environment. But it's also a challenge for, uh, for like folks that are working in, you know, customer service, uh, where the learning historically is, you know, you lean over to the person in the next cube and you say, how do you deal with this? You know, or where you're supposed to be cross-selling a different product when somebody is, you know, when you're talking to them about, uh, about an issue and, you know, how do you learn about those and really build your depth of knowledge? Uh, you know, those types of jobs have, have relied, obviously they have formal training programs, which we continue to administer, but how do you create that that crossover where you can just sort of ask the person next to you, say, what's the deal with this, you know? And there's some quirk that you have to know, that you would only know by the person telling you. So I think some establishing some mentoring programs for new employees uh, is gonna be really important and, 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 and really maybe being just much more vigilant about how those work uh, than perhaps we have been in the, you know, when everybody's in the same office uh, where it happens and maybe a little more casually. So I think those are some of the things that I'm hearing companies are saying that they are being more deliberate about how they are, you know, checking in with new employees, making sure that they're figuring out what did they not know so that we can continue to continue to um, bring up their skills quickly. Excellent. Well said. Uh, Jim, I, I have a question about something that you mentioned in passing, and I, I just wasn't quick enough on the uptake, uh, and it may connect for a lot of organizations. You mentioned that in terms of communicating, as, as Tony said, trying to stay connected uh, and have uh, employees feel like they are still part of some, some normalcy. You mentioned that uh, at your university, you have Friday, like a Friday cocktail hour kind of thing, or a Friday social hour. Is my recollection correct about that? Yes, sir. Uh, we do it via Zoom, and there's a theme each week. Uh, we've had themes like, what's your favorite car? What's your, uh, in this particular one, it was, what's your dream car? What's your first car? We had another one, what's your favorite food? It's gone on for quite a while. We've had a different theme each week. And uh, it's, it's voluntary, there, uh, there is no requirement to have to be there, but uh, I'm gonna guess that about 95% of our small staff has been there each week and it has fostered a great deal of camaraderie and it lasts throughout the week. Uh, and we're spread out quite a bit. We go from Lancaster to um, down to Murrieta and all the stuff in between. So it's tough to get out to see individuals we have the ability to do so. This has worked as an excellent tool to help us stay in contact with one another socially. The, the, the reason that I picked up on it was at, at, at one of the universities where I teach the, the college that I'm part of, the College of Business, it's the biggest unit within this university, which is not huge. It's not, I think, totally maybe, I don't know, 15,000 students or, or 10,000 students less. Uh, but the department I'm in has, has over 100 professors at full time and um, part time. And we started having these social hours for the professors. And at the beginning, they were very well attended. Uh, and as the weeks and the months now have gone by, uh, and I check in regularly because I'm just that kind of person and I'm a department chair, the attendance has been shrinking and shrinking and shrinking until the last one that I attended out of a hundred possible attendees, there were six people there. And, wow. and, and I'm wondering if anyone else has experienced, you know, the, this kind of, I don't know if it's Zoom fatigue or, or, or what, um, I, I just kind of tossed that out there because that's a development I hadn't anticipated. Anyone who want to jump on that one? I haven't done the social, as many of the social things um, 
uh, I have had to rethink like my board meetings. I have a very large board of directors. Um, uh, Santa Cruz Valley Economic Development Corporation is a nonprofit. So had to rethink what do those board meetings look like uh, so that they are quicker, um, more to the point. Uh, if I have a guest speaker, they have to be really interesting. Uh, you know, you have to really rethink some of that because I think a Zoom fatigue is real. Um, and it's really easy to, you know, and I, I you're back, circling all the way back to our conversation about do, do meetings get shorter? And I think we really have to, uh, you know, God help us. I would really love it if we got meetings more to the point and uh, more deliberate. And uh, I've started scheduling when I do have to do a Zoom meeting, scheduling them shorter because uh, you can't just go, you no longer have the, oh, well, I'm driving to go meet somebody for lunch or I'm walking down the hall to, uh, you know, the water cooler or use the restroom or whatever, where that used to give you a mental break and sort of digest one meeting before you went into the next. And you can just end up in Zoom after Zoom after Zoom. And it is, it is exhausting. Uh, it's a different mental energy than being in a regular meeting. And I know that there's been some folks who've done studies on that probably at, you know, at Eric's University uh, that, are, that are looking at that. And we need to, um, I think we need to recognize that that happens and, you know, that it's a different type of engagement is necessary um, because, and one of the things I've noticed, this is more something I've noticed in my personal life is when you're on a Zoom, there's only one conversation, right? Whatever that conversation is, that's the conversation versus when you're in a social setting, you have like these people gathering here and these people gathering here and these people gathering there and you talk to a couple of people and you move and talk to another couple of people. So again, it's an entirely different dynamic. Uh, and if you're not interested in a particular conversation, then you're not gonna show up the next time. So trying, you know, it is, it does require a different way of thinking about how you're gonna organize it as a social event, uh, you know, as well as your individual meetings being much more focused and to the point if you can. Excellent, well said. So uh, here's a question, Rob, that I think falls into your bailiwick almost exclusively. Uh, this individual asked, as an employer, being up to date with the most recent labor laws and remaining in compliance with those laws has become challenging over the years. This is now more complicated as many employees are now working from home. What should employers be paying attention to when it comes to the labor laws? What I said while I was muted was, oh boy. <laughs> it's a big topic. No, uh, sir. You'd get, you'd get uh, probably a long answer from a, a labor law lawyer. And uh, it, it's really vast and it's really challenging now for employers. I mean, as, as everybody knows, um, how do you deal with overtime? And what is overtime? And I know for me, I have to turn off every device in my house because no, not only does everybody want to reach me all the time because of connections in other time zones and in other countries, it, it, it can be 24 seven. And uh, there are other folks, I'm sure Tony's is well aware that his business is global. Uh, and so you have to, um, you have to create limits in the workplace. The, the, the scope of uh, labor laws and how it affects what's going on now, uh, that's all over the media. We just have to look at any of the, uh, the New York Times, the London Times, or the LA Times and see the battles that are going on. Um, the, the most recent one is the gig economy war uh, and the prop that's now before voters uh, about what do you do about drivers for companies like Uber and Lyft. And uh, a lot of businesses now with the internet, we might all be gig workers in, in one sense or another. So uh, sad to say, I don't have a good answer to that question. It, it's, it's, it's a lot and it's, I think probably sector driven and uh, talk to a lawyer. I mean, a real lawyer, not a law professor. Got it. Okay. Uh, that's like saying to a second lieutenant in the Army, hey, by the way, uh, for tomorrow's class, you have to memorize the Uniform Code of Military Justice. Uh, 
in any event. So uh, we're getting close here. I, um, I've got, I, there's one more question uh, that has come up and, and I, I think it's very appropriate uh, to what we've been talking about. And uh, so I'm gonna throw it out there. Uh, a skilled and diverse workforce is key asset to California companies competing in the global marketplace. Please share your thoughts on this as we navigate the current landscape. And uh, just, uh, just some brief comments. We've got about uh, probably six minutes left. So um, go ahead on anyone that wants to jump in there. Tony, that might be good for you because you're international. Yeah, Jim, thank you. Um, you know, yes, we, we do business uh, across the world. A lot of business here in the United States as well. I'd say it this way. Um, we, I keep on coming to this word agile. Um, we have always had to be agile in terms of reacting to time zones, um, when to take calls. Uh, you just touched on with Rob, some of the workforce um, you know, laws that are out there. And um, I think we do a really good job of having um, an agile team in positions that um, can be agile and um, are uh, within the labor code, um, you know, they can navigate that kind of landscape. If we need to take a call at six o'clock in the morning with a customer in France, um, we can do that. And uh, conversely, if it needs to be at nine o'clock at night for a customer in Japan, we can do that as well. While our workforce inside our factory continues to perform in, an, in a normal uh, shift fashion with breaks and all the things that we always have done and will continue to do. Um, but to kind of go back to the question a little bit more uh, and agility for the future um, and what I said earlier about brand, um, we're going to have to continue um, to train, to invest. We can't stop the education process. Um, we have to utilize the resources that may be new tools, new methodologies, uh, more distance learning, um, you know, and, and figure out how to do that in the workplace for our work uh, force that is on site. Um, we can't just rely 100% on 100% 100 on these vehicles. We have to do likely some hands-on learning. I mean, we do things like soldering and welding and things like that in our particular factory. So you have to be on site, you have to be present. How you do that effect effectively um, is just another variant of innovation and growth and technology maturation that we've, we've had to go through for decades now. So uh, hopefully I answered the question okay, um, but I, I think that word agility is always popping into my head. Uh, yes, sir, excellent answer, great insight. I pop, I popped in for a moment on this one too, because I guess partly because the universities now are, are, are filled, Bowers is no exception with students from all over the world uh, who are looking to come here and stay here. Uh, and it, it's really a political question how we deal with uh, skilled workers versus unskilled workers and work visas uh, and things like that. That is a political hot potato and it has been in this administration and also in the previous administrations, it doesn't matter whether they're Democratic or Republican, they're constantly trying to balance foreign workers coming in that have skills that American companies need uh, versus displacing American workers from jobs that they might otherwise have, jobs that Americans don't want to do, should we bring in workers from other countries that are willing to do it? It's, it's a big topic. Oh, it is. I, I jump in a little bit and say I think this is where this was where this mix of folks on this panel was really well done because it does come down to um, I mean obviously it's it's helpful to any company to have uh, a diverse workforce bringing in lots of different perspectives that really engenders creativity and, and new perspectives which I think is really helpful but I think that as we continue to train our workforce we need to be building those pipelines out of our schools uh, that that are bringing in that diverse workforce that Rob just talked about uh, and you know, we work with our local community college, which has a, a, a extension program, sort of similar in some ways to what Eric uh, runs at UCLA. And you know, they have programs to train workers, and, and they have a program that, uh, as an example, 
that uh, is called our Uniquely Abled Academy, which is about bringing folks that are on the autistic spectrum into doing CNC machining in a place perhaps like what Tony has or other, other uh, aerospace or, or related companies in there. And it's really tapping into a, a uh, particular sector of, uh, of pr prospective employees that before that training existed, it would have been very difficult for an employer to reach that type of employee. So to have the communication and partnerships between the companies about what they need in workforce, and then the resources that our educational institutions have about reaching uh, into more diverse networks, that partnership is really uh, can help keep that pipeline going. Uh, I think for companies to do it on their own, can, it can be challenging. And so we really need to be bringing all these folks together in partnership to, uh, to help companies continue to have that diverse workforce. Excellent, excellent. Panel, what great responses you have given. Uh, I'm awed by the experience that each one of you has and how you have applied it in your own lives and in your own responsibilities. I would ask you now, take about 30 seconds just to give a closing comment. Each of you, Tony, we'll start with you, but uh, keep it down to about 30 seconds if you can. Okay, thank you, Jim. I just wanna say thank you. Um, appreciate the opportunity with my fellow panelists to be a part of this panel today. Um, I, I said a few things about agility. Um, I, I think my closing comment would be um, for us in positions of leadership or um, you know, scope, uh, the ability to influence, um, connect with both the workforce and with your customers and take those timeouts to do that. I think it's so important for people to feel that connection and um, you know that brand trust. So uh, thank you for having me today and appreciate this opportunity. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, Dr. Eric. Yeah, thank you, Jim. And yeah, thank you to all the panel members. I feel like I actually learned a lot just by participating on the panel myself. So I'm really appreciative of the conversation. You know, I think moving forward, and, and I said this in the beginning, but UCLA, we do we do this reasonably well, but I would also just invite individuals that if, if you would like to have conversations about the future of workforce, or if you're seeing a particular need, you know, we want to extend access to our institution. And I think that's really critical. And sort of what we ended the conversation on is sort of equity, diversity, and inclusion, and creating these pipelines very early on in the educational ecosphere from K-12 to community colleges, to the CSUs, to the UC. And so um, I, I'm, I would be really interested in continuing this conversation and thank you all for your time today. Thank you so much, Eric. Holly. Um, again, I, I, I'll echo and say thank you for the opportunity. I think it's been a really great conversation. And uh, I would just end on that, you know, we are in a situation in 2020 where there are so many, um, just so many different issues that have arisen this year uh, beyond the pandemic uh, that have really, I think, forced companies to look at their practices. And I think that whether they're dealing you know, with a growing workforce, whether they're dealing with a, a reducing workforce, uh, there are resources uh, and partnerships that can help them through that. And I think the only way when we have, have issues as complex as what we're dealing with now, again, uh, you know, highest levels of unemployment that we've seen in years and, and that we really need to solve, the only way we're gonna solve them is by collaborating. And, uh, and so reach out beyond your own sphere, uh, reach out to the universities and the, the, the community colleges and to your you know, other officials and, and groups in the area, groups like BICA, groups like the Economic Development Corporation, because that's really the only way you're gonna get access to all that's out there. It's too much for any one person to know and to find, and, but that's the only way I think we're gonna really solve problems. Super, Holly, thanks a million. And Professor Rob. You're on mute. Well, there goes half of my 30 seconds. Holly, but it's okay because Holly and Eric and Tony kind of stole my thunder. I mean, I would say to companies, reach out to the universities and, and start tapping into the emerging workforce. Uh, find out what's going on there and establish those connections and influence the universities to give you what you need. Uh, there was a book some years ago called Future Shock. Uh, I don't know about the rest of you, but I'm, I still have past and present shock. Uh, it is a world <laughs> of change and uh, we're all just trying to keep up. 
Perfect. Thank you, Professor Rob. Nice closure. Well, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for this panel. University of Phoenix was proud to be your track sponsor today. And we thank our panel sponsors, University of California at Los Angeles and University of West Los Angeles one more time. Normally we would give a big round of applause for our panel today, but being virtual makes it a little bit difficult. So just a great big thank you for spending the morning with us today. Our keynote speaker will begin at 11.50 a.m. today. I encourage all to visit our exhibitors so you can enter the raffle of your chance for your chance to win a number of prizes, including round trip tickets on Southwest Airlines, a signed jersey by the Los Angeles Rams, and a whole bunch of gift cards. Thank you. Thank you.